Well, uh, good morning. Good morning, church. Good morning, Rooted. It's a joy to be with you this, this morning. Um, wow, Jono, thank you so much for sharing that. I didn't, I didn't know that was all going on in your life while I'm busy texting you and bothering you. <laughs> but uh, we thank God, man. We thank God uh, um, for, that, for that journey and all that he's doing in and through. Um, uh, family, so I... Uh, Many, there's many things on my, in my head and heart at the moment, but let me just get all my toys. You know, apparently, like, you, you know, you're not a legitimate man of God unless you have, like, an Apple device of some sort. But I'm, I'm on Android. I'm just saying that. But, you know, just in case anyone was judging, I thought, let me just bring an Apple just so you can know, okay, this guy's legit, you know? <laughs> Um, I, I said greetings uh, from, uh, as uh, Jono said, um, i married. My wife's name is Unati. Uh, she's uh, currently preparing for an event, so she couldn't make it uh, this morning. We've got four kids, and what he forgot to mention, actually, we've got another one on the, on the way. Yes. <laughs> so we're going to have five early next year, and, and no, I don't have a TV before you ask. It's... Uh, but we're just, we're, we're grateful, we're grateful um, uh, for, for, for children, as we know that they are a blessing. Uh, so one of the things I just wanted to brag about you guys is that, uh, you know, so I, I as I said, I, I lead We Will Worship, and we've been doing events uh, around different parts of Southern Africa. And funnily enough, like in the furthest parts of Southern Africa, someone comes up to me and says, hey, do you know One? Or, hey, I'm from Rooted, or I was at Rooted, and then I moved because of work or whatever it was. So I ended up in Durban, or I ended up, I think I even met someone in, in Harare, in Zim. Uh, but it's just been crazy, uh, you know, bumping into people. Hey, oh, I hear you friends with One, and, uh, you know, things. so you guys are making me famous, which is, <laughs> which is awesome. So it's, uh, uh, again, it's a joy to, to be with you this uh, this morning. So I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, awakening worship, or is, it, is, that, is that how we ended up? We said awakening worship. All right. Uh, you know, I guess just complimenting what's been happening with this uh, great uh, uh, Awaken series. I'm going to open up in prayer, then we'll get going. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you again that we get together like this as your people. What a joy. What an absolute privilege to gather together one heart, one mind, to worship one Lord, one God, one King. Uh, Won't you help us in the Spirit of God, teach us so that we can approach and worship uh, in the appropriate way, in a way that is pleasing and acceptable to our Father in heaven. That's why we gather here. So Lord, help us in this Spirit of God, speak to our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, family. So there's, there's uh, um, so much that can be said around the, 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 the topic of, of worship. I guess I, I, I am that worship guy. And uh, so I will naturally always speak about worship in some way or other and uh, find a way to weave it in into whatever it is that I speak about or teach about because it's what I believe, you know, Genesis to Revelation is about. It's about it's about worship. Um, and so I just want to share a few thoughts uh, uh, around that this, uh, this morning. There's so much, again, that can be said around it. So the, the scripture that we're going to be looking at is Romans 12.1. And when speaking about worship, this will inevitably be probably one of the top five scriptures that people will, 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 uh, will go to with regards to worship. And so uh, I just want to share some thoughts around this so that we just have a I guess, uh, a more context and understanding as we're approaching the Scripture. So let's read it. Romans 12.1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. As it's spelled out there by the Apostle Paul, that this is our true 
and proper worship, to offer up our bodies as living sacrifices. And now Paul is writing with a particular context in mind. He's a, he's a Jew. He's got a, a Hebrew background. Uh, so all the language that he's using in this particular portion of, uh, of Scripture is, is, uh, is ceremonial language, something that they would have been accustomed to because sacrifices were something that was uh, in their daily lives. And so I, I want us to track back a bit and look at the topic of sacrifice, of, of where that comes about or, or what was the, the general understanding around sacrifice. And uh, because that's where we pick up worship. And so one of the first places where worship is actually mentioned in, uh, in the Old Testament is in Genesis. Genesis 22 is the story of Isaac and Abraham. But in Genesis 21, Abraham and his wife Sarah have been trusting God for a child, praying, 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 trusting, 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 and God promises them a child and uh, that the day comes and the child is born and his name is Isaac. So you can imagine after praying all these years for something to come or a prayer to be answered, the prayer is answered, how ecstatic you, may, you, you, you would be then, right? After years, years of waiting. Some of us, ish, even just months waiting is a problem. Right? Years, years, years of waiting God gives you what he has promised or what you've been praying for. Abraham embraces uh, his son. And mind you, in, uh, in, in the ancient Near, Near East, your legacy was lived through your children. And so it was important that you had children so that your name could also continue. So it was a big deal that you have a child. And uh, so... Genesis uh, 20, 21, God meets with Abraham, says, Abraham, I want you to take your son. And it actually says, your only son. It says, your son, your only son. Like God is saying, hey, I know. I know, I know what it is, what he means to you. And he says, I want you to take him and offer him up as a burnt offering. You know, this always challenged me because, you know, we pray for stuff. And the, the longer you pray or wait for something, the more entitled you feel to it when you have it. Right? You feel like, yo, God, we've wrestled for this thing. Yo, God, we prayed for this thing. Therefore, when you give it to me, it's permanent. But no, fam, everything we have and everything that God gives us, we need to hold with an open hand. Because as soon as we close our hands to it, it's an idol. God needs to have access to everything that we have. Anyway, so Genesis 22 is where we'll pick it up. And then so now it speaks about the journey that Abraham undergoes uh, in, in bringing this offering of his son to the Lord. And so Genesis uh, 22, uh, from verse 3, it says, Early next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. All right, so you need to get this. Is that God tells Abraham, I need you to go to the mountain where I tell you and go offer up your son as a burnt offering. Abraham responds to his people and he says, my son and I are going up to go and worship. God tells him, offer up a sacrifice, offer up a burnt offering. His response is, we are going to worship. Worship and sacrifice are inseparable. Yeah. 
Those are two inseparable things, one and the same thing. So the thing with sacrifice is, it's, it, it, in our understanding, it's, it's not quite the same as they had you know, back in the day. Because we don't really offer up sacrifices. Well, I don't think we do. You never know. <laughs> but anyway, we'll come back to that. So the, the word that's used there is the Hebrew word shakar. Shakar means to uh, bow down before, to kneel before, or to lie prostrate before. And it would be something that would be done to a dignitary or someone of importance. And the whole idea behind it was that it was, it's an external expression of your internal posture. And so you would kneel down, bow down, or lie prostrate before someone that is honorable, a king, a deity, or whatever it is, to express your worship before them. And so you would do something to show what is happening. You'd do something externally to show what's happening internally. Um, yeah, so it's, a, so it's an external expression of your internal posture. And so, so this would be done also with the hope of drawing near to the one that you're worshiping. And inevitably, it would end up in a sacrifice, and a sacrifice being offered up. And in that culture also, um, the, the concept of drawing near to someone was, a, was about offering a sacrifice to someone. So when you, when you hear the Apostle James uh, speaking, he says, uh, draw near to God that he may draw near to you. It's the idea of offering a sacrifice. That's how you draw near to, to God. And, uh, and that's how they approach God in those particular days. So today, uh, like I said, we probably don't do sacrifices unless you're doing a braai. Maybe that could, you know, work out as a sacrifice. And uh, so, so we use sacrifice in, in, the, in the sense of, you know, you sacrifice something. Maybe someone sacrificed a job to stay at home. Uh, that kind of thing. But it's, it's an expression that we use. You, not, you don't really imagine someone kind of laying a job contract on the altar and they, you know, that's my sacrifice. But it's the idea that you give up something that you value or something that's of value for someone or something that's of value or that you value. Yeah. Right. That's, that's the idea of, of sacrifice. And um, uh, I mean, growing up, your, 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 your parents... Bro, like, I feel like you're pointing at me, man. Like, <laughs> like let's turn them on. Let's turn them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like the idea of sacrifice, you know, if, if you had folks like mine, they would remind you of sacrifice. Yeah. Right? They'd remind you, you know, how much they've sacrificed for you. And, uh, you know, for me, it, it, it would always be followed by, by that uh, beating by syllables. If you guys, do you guys know that beating, getting a beating by a syllable? You know, so, so we used to get, uh, like Christmas time, we used to get new clothes. It was like a thing. I, I don't know if it's still a thing now. But uh, Christmas time, that's when you know you get some new clothes to go to church in and, you know, things like that. And uh, so Christmas time was always like a festive time for us, hanging out with family and friends and things like that. Get home after the church service, still in your new clothes playing with your cousins and things like that, excuse me, and then you, you know, fall somewhere, tear your shirt or something like that, Yo, and then you meet your mother, <laughs> you meet your mother, and then your mother will, will then give you that beating by syllable, you know, do you know how much this, you know, <laughs> right? And because uh, and, and they would remind you how much they sacrificed for you to have whatever it is that you have. Yeah. Right? And uh, so that's the idea. But so how, so how they would actually offer up sacrifices in those days is that they, they, you would get an animal. So it would be, again, something that costs you something. Yeah. It needs to be something that costs you something. So you bring an animal, whether it was, it was a lamb, uh, uh, what, whatever animal that you wanted to, 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 to bring before the Lord, 
that animal would then be brought to the head of the home, whoever was the priest in that home. It would either be the, the, the father of the family or the eldest son. And that, that offering would be given to them and that they would ins- inspect it. They would check, is there a blemish, is there a spot, is there a wrinkle on this animal? If they found it to be no blemish, no spot, no wrinkle, they would deem it perfect and holy and pleasing to the Lord. That it could be now be acceptable as an offering to the Lord. Right. So, so here's the important thing that we need to catch with that is, is that if worship is an external expression of our internal posture, what we bring matters. Because it, it's a, it serves as a reflection of what's happening internally. So you can't just bring last minute things. All right? So that's why it would have to be checked to see, is it? Spotless, blameless, without wrinkle. Because you're offering it to the Lord, it needs to be perfect. It needs to be the best. And funny enough, if you read through the Old Testament, you see this happening in the worship of Israel. The further further away they got from the Lord and the, 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 the ways of the Lord, you see, their offering began to reflect that. They started to bring in lame animals, animals with blemishes, with spots, with wrinkles. So what we bring matters because it reflects what's happening internally. So this animal would then be offered. It would be put on an altar where there would be a raging fire on there, the animal placed on the altar. Then it would get consumed by the flames, and with smoke would rise up. And if the Lord received it, it would be a sweet-smelling incense or a pleasing incense, a pleasing smell or pleasing aroma. That's if he received it. Then he would say, okay, this is acceptable to me. And again, in, in that culture, if someone said you smelled good, it meant they received you and you had favor with them. If they said you were an odor or a stench in their nostrils, it meant they were rejecting you. And so this is the same thing that Apostle Paul um, echoes in uh, in, uh, 2 Corinthians 2 when he says that we are, through Christ, a pleasing aroma to God and to those who are being saved. But to those who are, are perishing, we are a an odor or the smell of death, right? So it's that thing of, oh, if it's pleasing to the Lord, if we accept it by the Lord, he says, man, you smell good. You smell good. So if someone says you smell good, you must know you're good with him. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and that's how sacrifices would be offered back in the day. All right, so let's go back to our text in Romans uh, 12.1. Let's read it again. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That language again, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. All right. So true and proper worship is us offering our lives as living sacrifices uh, to the Lord. But before that, it says in view of God's mercy. Right? So our ability to offer up our bodies as living sacrifices hinges on our view of God's mercy. So if we have a correct view of God's mercy, we will offer up our bodies as living sacrifices. This is so important Because at the beginning of the text, it says, therefore, which means there was something before. Ha! That was my charismatic. (laughs) Do you see that? Therefore, before. Hey. (laughs) Because the thing is, guys, for the last probably 11 chapters of Romans, Paul has been giving us snippets of God's mercy so that we get to this Point where he says, I urge you, therefore I urge you. 
So let's uh, just take a few snapshots of where God, of where Paul speaks about um, God's mercy in uh, in in the book of Romans. So great, great scripture. Probably all know it. One Romans sixteen. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For In it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. In the gospel, in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed. Okay, what's Paul talking about here? Let's say righteousness. All right. Righteousness is right relationship, right standing. You are in perfect alignment with the Lord. Nothing off. We're good, right? We're good. And, and that's, uh, we, we need to hold that. All right. So let's say where this chair is, is uh, righteousness, perfect, perfect and right relationship with God. Uh, I can't step down, right? I'm just, just checking, you know? So this is perfect and right relationship, a right standing with, with God. That's God's righteousness. I need uh, uh, to... Are you strong enough to come and... and uh, not? Okay, anyway, I need, I need two people, please. I, I won't harm you. I won't... There we go. <laughs> Sorry, what's your name? Wesley. Wesley. Wesley and Kenny. Kenny. Wesley and Kenny. All right. Thank you, Wesley and Kenny. Uh, Wesley, can you stand here for me, please? And can you a little wider? A little wider. There we go. All right. So let's say this is right standing, right relationship uh, with with God. Right? You with me? This is this is this is it. This is it. Now, Paul speaks about, uh, you know, in the beginning, man, our, our father Adam was uh, given the instruction not to disobey God. I- I'm summarizing a-, a bit of Genesis, okay? Uh, and this is what Paul speaks about in Romans 5. It says that through Adam, Adam was told, listen, Adam, if you sin, if you disobey me, sin and death will enter. Yeah. Right. And Adam did that. And uh, as a result of that, everyone born after Adam is born with a sinful nature or a propensity or disposition towards sinning. Everyone that's born. That's what Paul writes about Romans 5. So if you're born in this earth, if you're breathing, you are born on this side of God's righteousness. You are born in the red. Are you with me? Okay. So, Wesley and Kenny. Kenny. Wesley and Kenny, all right. So they're on this side of God's righteousness. They are in the red, just like all of us, right? So Kenny out here, he's a little further out because <laughs> Kenny's been busy, <laughs> right? He is on the streets. <laughs> and Wesley also, but you know, ah, okay. So the thing about Kenny is that Kenny knows that he's far from God because he's on the streets. Like, like he knows, man, because of the stuff that he's, he's done, the stuff that he gets up to, that, listen, God wants nothing to do with me. I'm, I'm far from God. Right? And he's like, ah, it's those people, ah, no, God won't even let me go to church, that type of thing. They, they won't even let me go walk into the walls of a church. Because he knows, he, he's aware because of the nature of the sin that, 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 that he's, he's committed, right? And uh, Wesley here, Wesley, generally a wholesome dude, right? Generally a wholesome dude. He uh, helps with after-school programs. Um, he, may, he might help with like a carpool or two. He doesn't swear taxi drivers, 
Uh, when he's at KFC, he gives hope. To ran for hope. <laughs> right? So you, you, have, you have two different people. They're both on this side. You know, so, so sometimes the challenge with people like Wesley is that they don't think they're very far from God. Right? Because they generally live wholesome, wholesome lives. Right? And, and more so when they look over at the streets, you know, the people on the streets. And they're like, you know what? I might drop the ball now and then, but at least I'm not as bad as. Right? And, and often I wonder... You know, do people still get this gap here? As much as you might be this close, but you still, do you get? And, and, I, and, and so I want to maybe try to help us understand to, to, to get a, 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 a bit more of, of the separation from God. Is, uh, it was probably about four years ago now, where th there was that, that incident here the, at, at Dross, yeah. where that guy raped a young girl in a Dross. Now, I, I remember that, that whole thing really kind of hit home for me, because my daughter was seven years old at that time as well. So, and, uh, and and already, even as, as I'm mentioning that, I'm sensing the, the sense of lament uh, and, and grief in the room. But anyway, that was a heinous crime. It was, it was a heinous crime. And, and I remember that moment when all that was happening, the responses that were coming out, particularly on social media. You know, people were like, listen, this guy needs to be shamed. And they did shame him. You know, they put out all his details, all his, where he works, where he lives, all that stuff. And they said, you know, this guy needs to be beaten. And people said, hey, this guy needs to be executed. We need to bring back the death penalty for guys like this. And look, I, I get it because of the heinousness of the crime. And, and it is an appropriate response to, to something like that. And it almost felt like in those weeks, like the collective anger, rage, and wrath of the nation was bearing down on this one dude because of the heinousness of the crime. But take that anger... That rage, that wrath, and place it here in this gap. Multiply it by infinity, and you're still nowhere near what the wrath of God was that was due to us. Sometimes I think we, don't, we forget. We forget. So Paul writes in, in Romans 3 that actually, guys, no one, there's no, not one that is righteous. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 8, he then says, you know what, we were at war with God. We had enmity, enmity with God. So it's not like, ah, God and I were... We would just weren't talking. No, we were at war with God. We were enemies of God in every way. Whether you were him or him. There was nothing in us that wanted him. And so that was the wrath that was due us. But what did God do? In His mercy, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to come in this world, 
born of the imperishable seed of the spirit so that that sinful nature so that he doesn't carry that he lived the life that we were supposed to live blameless spotless without wrinkle perfect he died he rose again ascended to heaven and then as Romans 9 tells us uh, 10:9 tells us that if we confess with our mouths and believe with our hearts that Jesus Christ that God raised Jesus from the dead then we are saved what do we save from the wrath of god and eternal death what do we save for the righteousness of god and eternal life So what does Jesus do when we put our faith in him? Remember it's a righteousness by faith. So when we choose to put our faith in him, Jesus takes our sin and causes us through the work of the cross to cross over into his righteousness. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you gentlemen. You can sit down. So it's a righteousness by faith. So now let's go back to our text. Romans 12:1 again. Now you can kind of hear like the plea of Paul in this. He says, "Therefore I urge you, Brethren, brothers, sisters, I urge you in view of God's mercy. Get a view for it. After all that he has done, yeah. offer up your body as living sacrifice. In view of God's mercy, it's holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In other translation would say your reasonable act of worship or reasonable act of service this is what makes sense it's logical when you have a view of god's mercy you offer up your body as a living sacrifice it is it's what makes sense it's the appropriate response are you with me but it hinges on our view of his mercy if we feel god owes us something we're not going to offer up our lives if we feel god isn't all that or what he's done for us isn't all that our worship isn't going to be all that Right? So what I, what I love about the Lord is that you know when he asks us to do something he always gives us handles on how to do that. And so we know today that uh we don't offer up sacrifice. We don't offer up animals. I'd be concerned if you still were. I'd have to speak to Anne and but we're still called to offer up sacrifices. And again scripture gives us a handle on what sacrifices we're to offer up. So what are the scriptures 1 Peter 2:5 4 to 5. As you come to him the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices. acceptable to God through Jesus Christ that we are here as a people church is not about a building i know you know that it's about the people that make up the building we are those living stones we are the bricks that build God's spiritual house and because the spiritual house it demands spiritual sacrifices and so what are those spiritual sacrifices in hebrews 13 the writer of hebrews points us to what those things are through jesus therefore let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Yeah. Amen. 
The fruit of lips that openly profess his name and do not forget to do and then says, and do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices God is pleased. Yeah. Alright, so he says these are the spirit these are the, 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 the sacrifices that you to offer, a sacrifice of praise. And what that looks like is that you give God the fruit of your lips, and then the second part of it is that you do good. Right. And again, this is the theme that you find throughout Scripture. is loving God and loving your neighbor. Yeah. Throughout Scripture, it's the same thing. Can't just love God. Loving God's got to express itself through you loving your neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Right? So, so he speaks about this. Okay. So first one is fruit of lips that openly profess his name. So it's this thing that we do. And we got out and we started singing songs. That's giving God the fruit of our lips. Declaring who he is, declaring his majesty, speaking, singing, doing all these things. So these are the sacrifices we need to bring. And remember, because it's only a sacrifice if it costs you something. Otherwise, it's just a thing. And in the, in the same way, giving gifts, all gifts are good. So if you want to give a gift in this house, it's all good. But not all gifts are sacrifices. Maybe we'll come back to that one. <laughs> Fruit of lips. Guys, when we come here, we're here to lift our voices in worship to the Lord. Yeah. It's part of what we do. Yeah. We're here to lift hands. We're here to lie prostrate, uh, bow before, kneel before, whatever it is, because we are approaching the Lord. Yeah. Remember again, uh, worship, an external expression of your internal posture right so what we do in this space matters and so one one of my uh i've realized in our in our modern church culture we sing a lot about praising god but we actually don't praise god so the thing is in scripture when it speaks about praising praise uh, there's always an action that follows praise and so you'll have, I think, there's either seven or nine Hebrew words expressing praise, depending on your Bible research. All right. But they've all, they are all actions, whether it's to todah, whether it's to barak, whether it's to, to, to shout out, are you, are you with me? So it's never just, hey, God, I praise you. Okay, then praise him. All right? Praise, because it's an action. It's something that you do. You don't just say. So if we're singing something that demands a response or an action, we need to bring that. That's why we have these expressions, so that we can respond accordingly. Now, I want to challenge us in this because in some places they say, ah, culturally, it's not our thing to be expressive. Do you know what, fam? Nah. I love what was said about this being a transcultural. Right? Because it means God's ways supersede yeah. our individual culture's preferences. Yeah. And so we've got to bring that. We've got to bring that. If we're saying we're praising God, then let's praise Him. And you know the, the powerful thing... With praise is that if we're all doing it together, it actually doesn't feel weird. Yeah. If we're saying, hey, we're going to sing a shout of praise, yeah. then we all shout, yeah. we're all weird together. Oh, yeah. are, you, are you with me? Yeah. But we've got to bring something. And for some of you, this really has to be something that you sacrifice for. Sacrifice your self-consciousness, your image, or whatever it is. In that moment when you're feeling like, I need it, Neil, but it's going to be weird. I don't know. Sacrifice. It's going to cost you something. Might be uncomfortable. That's a sacrifice. You were called to bring a sacrifice of praise before the Lord. So I want to challenge you in this. Is go deeper. Go further. Give more. And remember, our sacrifice, our sacrifice is a reflection of our what we bring is a reflection of what, what's happening internally. As I've said, worship is an external expression of our internal posture. 
right? So that's the, that's the first aspect of that. Then the second part is do not forget to do good. Because we can do this here, jump up and down here, but we've still got to do life out there. And so as we do life out there, we've got to continue with this posture, with our hands raised, with our hearts bowed before the Lord, as we go and do life with, with people. And I love what it says, and it says, uh, and to share with others, to share with others. So when we put our faith in Jesus Christ in this gospel, we become righteous, Christ makes us righteous. But then because we are righteous, we are called to live righteously or do righteous works. And that's what this is about. We don't do the works to become righteous. We are righteous. But as an expression, because remember, just like worship, if we say we're righteous, then it needs to express itself in the way that we live our lives. We can't say, "Ah, I'm righteous, I'm righteous, I'm righteous. Then you live like... You're on the streets. No, fam. All right? And so these are these righteous works that we've got to do. That's why we've got to do good. And it says to, and, and to share with others. I thought that's, that's so interesting, talking about sharing. Guys, sharing is tough. Sharing is tough. All right? You know, as a, as a, as a man with... How many people in the house? In any given day, I'm going home to five people. Any given day, right? And so now and then I will buy myself like something I enjoy, like a chocolate. And on my way home, I'm having this internal conversation of do I park the car and enjoy this chocolate, a full chocolate? Or do I walk in the house with it and get a bite? Now, I'm a grown man, guys, and I love Jesus. And I still have these wrestles. And that's just with the chocolate. Right? (laughs) And it even comes more difficult when you've saved up for something. And then Holy Spirit impresses it on your heart to give to someone else. But this is what the gospel demands. This is what true worship is, because it's got to cost you something. And these are the sacrifices, as it says, for such sacrifices, God is pleased. That's again that ceremonial language. When God, when that incense rises up, when your offering rises up, and he smells and he says, I'm pleased with that. That's what God, that's what the Father is is pleased with, is that kind of worship. So to come before Him in worship, in in declaring His praises like we did this morning, but also just to continue in that, in everything that we do. All right, let's go back to our scripture and we'll close off here. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. This is your true and proper worship. Ah, Can we stand together? All right, uh, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to continue in a, in a time of worship. I want to encourage you, as we go into this time of worship, really go further. Respond, take a moment, before they even start, just take a moment.
to reflect on God's mercy. And if nothing moves you, ask the Holy Spirit to open your eyes to what the Lord has done for you. So that you can respond accordingly. It's, you know, one of the ills that are in today's church is that it's all about our preferences and and what we want. People choose churches based on how good the worship music is, based on how cool the preaching is. And it's about me, 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 what I want. And, you know, and I'd ask myself, you know, when, when people make comments of, yo, oh, worship was good today. Like, what do you mean by that? Isn't it the same God? Or is it just because you had someone with a really cool voice that sang your songs? Oh, therefore it was good. No ways, family. When we gather to worship, we got to give everything. Why? It's the same God. It's not about who's up there, what songs are being sung. It's the same God. And we need to come ready to offer Him the fruit of our lips. Regardless of, you know, the song or the style, the whatever it is. But just to come in ready to say, do you know what, God? I'm going to show you how, what I'm feeling like inside. I'm going to give you that external expression to show you, Lord, what's happening here internally my gratitude so no matter what 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 songs i'm there i'm there before they start singing i'm there that's my posture because i'm here to worship i'm not here as a consumer or a spectator i'm here to worship i'm here gathering with other worshipers other people that have decided to follow jesus other people that have decided listen we're doing this life thing we're going to give him the fruit of our lips and we're going to do good we're going to share we're going to love god with all our heart soul strength and we're going to love our neighbors we love ourselves and we're gathering together as a people in this place to encourage one another to say brother sister keep going keep at it we know what this thing is about we know what we're here for we're not here for feels we're not here for goosebumps we're here for the lord to worship him that's why we gather here and so that is the posture that we we gather with and so i want to encourage you go deeper go further sacrifice Heavenly Father, you have called us to love you with all our heart, soul, and strength. That's everything. With all our heart, all our soul, all our strength, everything. Lord, you want everything. Even as we reflected on Abraham offering Isaac up, Isaac was his everything. Isaac was his prayers, his hopes, his dreams, his present and his future. But he was willing to lay that on the altar. His most prized possession or thing in the whole world, Lord, he offered that up. He was willing to offer that up. Why? Because he was coming before you, the one true and living God. Help us, Lord, that we would offer our lives up as living sacrifices, that as we live, it would be an external expression of our internal posture and internal gratitude for all that you've done for us. Above all, Holy Spirit, give us a view of the mercy that we are recipients of, reciprocants of. Open our eyes up, Lord, that we would not take it for granted.
so we could respond in true and proper worship.